So here, we're starting with the most basic of generic open layers maps. In this case, um, this is an open layers map that is using the OpenStreetMap data source. And you can see and this is common for these various sort of externally hosted base map collections. There's going to be some copyright information that is provided as a part of the base map that's going to show up um, within the map, the map area. Um, there is a generic open layers um, attribution element that you can add to your maps that allows you to essentially define block of text or other information that can also be displayed on the map that is defined as a place where you can put attribution, essentially credits for data providers or other sources that you put into your map. But Google, Bing, and, and uh, OpenStreetMap helpfully provide that for you already. Uh, though in the case of the Google Maps, when we look at the code, I'll show you some additional um, style elements that um, Google asks you to include that essentially um, allows for the positioning and display of the sort of the standard Google stuff. And you'll see that in a, in a minute when we go through the, um, the multi-map example. So here, this is our basic map and if we view source on this, this should hopefully look fairly familiar in terms of the pattern of what you're adding to the map from what we were doing in Google, um, where we have at the top our standard HTML headers. We're importing a JavaScript library in this case, since this is essentially the generic um, open layers mapper using OpenStreetMap. OpenStreetMap support is built directly into open layers. So there's not any additional JavaScript library that you have to import to be able to use the OpenStreetMap data. That's different from Yahoo and, or actually, Yahoo disabled their API. So I had old examples that used Yahoo and I've tried to purge those examples from my code, but I still apparently have not purged it from my brain. Um, uh, Bing and Google, where you actually um, need to use their API in conjunction with the open layers. But here, we're just importing the open layers JavaScript library. Just like we were doing with the Google Maps API, the open layers JavaScript library provides all of the sort of hidden functionality, the code that they provide for giving us the interactivity with the data that you're bringing in. So it's all of that code that then allows us to define what our map or maps are, what layers are going to go into those maps, what controls are going to be displayed, all of that stuff that we've already worked with in, turn, in the Google context, we can now think about translating into the open layers context. So we've got then this block of JavaScript that again is much like what we were doing in Google. In this case, I'm actually defining some variables outside of the initialization function, um, which is uh, important when you're doing some of these activities where those, those variables have to live outside of that, that initialization function when it, when it is uh, executed. So here we're actually creating a map variable that is, it actually lives as an empty variable before we even initialize the map. We have a layer variable that exists before we create the map and, or before you can initialize things. That gives it persistence outside of that function that's going to be run. Um, this relates to, in what's in, in many programming languages, JavaScript among them, this concept of scope. So where a variable retains its value and it can be used. So this is why we're setting up at least those, uh, those, that map and layer variable there. Otherwise, I'm just setting up, there, up, up above that the latitude, longitude, and zoom values that I want to use in my map. So that allows me to then put generic terms into the map definition itself, knowing that the things that I potentially want to change are conveniently located right here at the top of my JavaScript. So this is just a way to streamline your development process. 
If we look at the structure, if we move all the way down out of the head area, we can see just like in Google Maps, we have some basic HTML, and then we have a uh, div that in this case is given an ID of map. And surprise, surprise, that's actually the element of the document object model that open layers is going to be told to put the map in. Again, just like we were doing in Google Maps. So now let's look at the initialization function itself, which is only, you know, from 13 to line 13 to line 28, um, the, really the meat of the creation of the map and the initial settings for the map. And as this is a very simple generic map, you can see we're basically just going through this process of creating a new map object, you know, where previously we were using the Google, uh, uh, basically a reference to the Google function for creating a map object. Here we're using the open layers function for creating that map object. We're then creating a new layer. In this case, it is an open street map layer. So we have, we're naming a variable layer. We're assigning basically this open layers dot layer dot OSM. This is a way of saying from open layers, we want to create a layer object. And more specifically, that layer object should be an OSM or open street map layer object. Each one of the possible layer types that you can add to different layer objects that you can add to open layers have a pattern like that where that third element, where, which is OSM here, represents the type of layer you can add. If you start looking through the documentation for the um, open layers API, essentially the, the JavaScript reference for this, you're going to see dozens of different layer types that you can add. So this is one of those distinguishing characteristics between open layers and Google Maps is that you have a, many, many more options in terms of the types of data, the types of, um, of, of source or data sources that you can integrate into an open layers based mapper compared to Google Maps. So here we're creating this layer object and then we're adding this layer, map.addLayer and then the name of then the, the essentially that variable that we just created that has that layer object. So this is adding that layer to the map. Okay? We're then actually then changing the center location of the map. And this is this is one of the areas that I alluded to in the lecture in terms of the the potential additional complexity that you get with the additional options that you have in open layers where in Google Maps, you have one coordinate reference system, one projection to choose from. And that's the spherical Mercator um, projection system that Google, and by the way, Bing and OpenStreetMap use in terms of their, the, the uh, projections they support. But Open Layers allows you to actually display data from a wide variety of projections and potentially integrate them into a single map interface. I say potentially because um, there, are some, there are some requirements to download some additional JavaScript into the client, into the web browser. If you want to do that uh, more complicated tr coordinate transformation stuff from sort of arbitrary, um, one arbitrary projection to another, it's essentially like putting Proj4 that you've been working for the, that's the basis for the CS to CS you were working with, it's like putting Proj4 into the browser, allowing a, an application that's running in the browser to do those coordinate transformation calculations on the fly. Yeah. So if you took off those four lines, right. they would go back to the default of the UTM Mercator? No, in this case, what we're needing to do, by just opening up, the, creating this, um, this open street map layer and adding it to our map, that map is going to automatically use whatever the coordinate reference system is for the, fir for the first layer that's added to it. But the map just treats it as X, Y. It doesn't, it, you know, it, 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 in terms of the coordinate reference system. If you were to read that information out, we could actually get the projection information from this map object here. And this is exactly what we're doing. So we can read that information and get the identifier 
for the projection. But in this case, since we didn't specify when we created the map object, we didn't specify any options here. Um, and we actually didn't even specify anything related to a projection here. OpenStreetMap layers have automatically have that spherical Mercator projection associated with it. By assigning that layer to this map, we're essentially indirectly setting the projection for the map. You end the, and there are some examples in one of the, some of the source code I'll show you in a minute. There's actually a good um, page on the web that talks about this, the specific, some examples of this spherical Mercator issue and how you can look at some examples in open layers for specifying other projections and how to define what those projections look like. That's also discussed in the book. Um, but here, we're do, trying to do something very basic where I didn't want to calculate what my center position is in spherical Mercator XY coordinates. I wanted to think instead in latitude longitude. So I created these two variables up here that are just WGS84 latitude longitude values, understanding that I'm going to have to convert them to the projection of my map at some later time. And that later time has come here, where I'm setting the map center. I could just provide the coordinates in that spherical Mercator system and not worry about this whole transform function here. But since I wanted to be able to define my center in geographic coordinates, I have to now do this transformation where I'm saying, basically transform this value, this longitude-latitude value, from based in this projection, EPSG 4326, okay? And convert it to a pair, a pair of coordinates that are based on the projection that's defined for the map. So this, this is an instance where I don't even know what those coordinates are, I don't display them, but I'm forcing open layers to do that calculation for me so that it recenters to the place it should. If I didn't do this transformation, it would end up zooming into some, you know, latitude, longitude, numeric looking spot, totally unrelated to the, the XY coordinate system of the larger map. You know, it's like zooming to, you know, the latitude, longitude coordinates for Albuquerque in a UTM uh, coordinate system. You're going to zoom down to the lower left corner of that, of that coordinate system. You're going to be nowhere near where Albuquerque is because you've got an XY system that's measured in hundreds of thousands of meters and your decimal degrees are from zero to, you know, 180. <laughs> it's too late to try to do math in my head, apparently. Uh, um, so we, we basically create this new map center and we zoom to it. So this is all part of this set map center uh, command. Ultimately, we do the conversion to get a latitude longitude and we zoom to that location. So that's going to force the map to then go to that center point that, that we specified. And that's it. Um, and we could even potentially not even set the map center and just have it default to a global view. Um, but in this case, you know, in every instance where you're developing a map, you're going to want to be explicit about where that map should be centered. Um, we also have, just like we did in our Google Maps, some basic style settings that we're using for that, uh, that canvas, essentially, where the map is going to be um, added. And you can play around with those style settings to get the map where you want and at the size you want. So before I move on from this, this sort of basic structure and approach, are there any questions? Okay. Hopefully, hopefully this is not too foreign, given what you've already been doing. So now let's take a look at some of the other options you have for um, some of the, uh, I describe them as proprietary uh, base maps that you can bring in. So in this case, I've actually added a new control. I've added a layer picker that we'll look at in just a minute where we have options to enable any of the base maps that I've added as layers to this map. So in this case, I've basically got 
four Google layers, the physical, the, essentially the terrain, street maps, the hybrid street map satellite and satellite. And then I've got three variations on Bing maps hosted by Microsoft. And then we've got our open street maps as well. So this is a case where you can actually have a map interface that allows a user to choose a variety of externally hosted base maps over which they may view other data that you've, that you've also added to the map interface. So this is before you know, we even talk about any data that we're hosting. These are just you know, a variety of sources that we can tap into. So let's take a look at this. So the first thing you're going to notice is that I'm actually bringing in some additional APIs up top, where here, um, in addition to on line four, or line, line five, the open layers JavaScript library, which of course you need for all of these. Um, and by the way, this, this call for the open layers JavaScript library is pointing to the copy of it that is hosted on open layers systems. And you'll also notice that I'm not specifying a version here. What this is going to do is it's going to get the current released version of open layers from their system. That's really handy because as they uh, make uh, revisions or updates, you're going to get those automatically. The downside is that if they break something with those revisions or updates or change the API, your maps may not work the way you, they previously did. So you get automatic updates, cool. They may break your map, not so cool. So it's something to think about. Because you can actually download the whole open layers JavaScript uh, code base, put it on your own system and point at that instead. So if you want to lock in the version of open layers that you're working, or if you really want to start getting fancy, you started hacking on the JavaScript that they've written, um, you can have a local copy that you point to instead. Here, we're pointing to the copy that's hosted by open layers. You'll notice that we've now added the um, Google, uh, Google APIs uh, link as well. So this allows the code that's written by open layers or provided by open layers to use the Google API to interact with the Google servers. So this is essentially one JavaScript library that we're importing requiring another one be made available. Um, and then, and this is actually one of the note that I have, um, which I added today with the link to this, uh, this site that has some information about that spherical mercator, um, uh, some examples and some discussion about the use of spherical mercator in the context of these uh, commercial or proprietary um, uh, base maps. You'll also notice at the top that I'm referring, I'm also bringing in an additional style sheet, the open layers Google styles.css. That's providing some specific styles that are related to the display of the information on, for the Google base map. So if we go back to the map, you'll see that we've got down here in the lower left corner the Google logo with the link. In the right corner, then we've got the information about where the source data are coming from and the copyright from Google. Um, those styles allow the, for the definition of where that stuff is going to show up and how it's going to be displayed. Um, so this, that's just part of the baggage that you want to keep in mind when including some of the Google, um, the Google layers in your maps, which is also consistent with sort of their terms of service. So if we go back to our source code, if you're working with Bing maps, you're going to need to get an API key from Bing uh, to actually uh, have them respond to your requests. And the link for getting that is right, right there in the comment for the Bing Maps API key that I, that I have attached there. Um, so if you're going to be doing this, 
Go ahead and get your own, your own API key. It's free. It's just you register with them and get it from them. Um, and then you use that as a part of your requests to the system for Bing map layers. Just as I was doing earlier, I'm defining some global variables here in lines uh, 13 through 20. Uh, again, my latitude, longitude, zoom level, creating my global map variable. And then I'm also creating these named variables for all the layers that I'm adding. I'm going to use those variables later when I create, create them further down in the code. But I'm creating those variables as essentially empty variables outside of that initialization block. We then get into our initialization function. So here, we've got the start of our initialization function. We're creating a new open layers map. In this case, it's a generic, it's a generic open layers map. We're telling it to, in that line 25, that it should be linked to the map uh, div down in the body of the page, just like we've done before. But here we're, we're providing a bunch of additional options, including, in this case, the bounds that are a calculation, basically, uh, that you need to do if you're converting uh, into those spherical Mercator units. So this is sort of a magical formula for uh, defining, essentially, a bounding box that it goes from minus 128 to a positive 128 uh, degrees. <laughs> um, and there's actually, if I remember correctly, this, this, uh, this actually came out also out of, the, out of the, the reference book that we're using in terms of an explanation for this otherwise magical incantation for calculating what a bounding box would consist of in the spherical Mercator coordinate system that um, that these, all of these base maps are based in. There's a maximum resolution value that we're providing so that um, that provides some limits to um, the, the resolution that's going to be displayed by the map. It essentially puts some constraints on how, you, how much you can zoom. Um, we're defining here the units. So again, we're in spherical Mercator, so we're defining the units in meters. We are um, defining the projection as this EPSG 3857. This is something to keep in mind, and they talk about this in that online um, page that I, was, that I linked to earlier. EPSG 3857, and we all remember EPSG codes now, um, is an official uh, representation or definition of a previous EPSG code that was not actually registered or officially defined anywhere except by Google, and that was EPSG 900913, which, if you squint your eyes, spells Google. <laughs> As as Google was, uh, was basically defining the coordinate system that they were going to use for their mapping applications, and they wanted to try to create an EPSG, something that looked like an EPSG code, this is the one that they used. So you're going to see in some systems and some mapping applications a reference to EPSG 900913. That doesn't exist in the official specification, um, but it has snuck into some implementations because that's just the way things kind of spread in these web applications. So the more official definition of this exact same projection, or pretty damn close, if you get into some of the technical details, there's, there are debates you know, around the minutia. Um, you have this. EPSG 3857, which is the equivalent of this EPSG 900913. Here we're also then um, defining a display projection of 4326, which then allows us to um, actually uh, have an additional reference related to the map 
in terms of doing some coordinate transformation more intelligently in the system. So this is an example of creating a map object like we saw in Google, where you can have a very stripped down definition of a map object, or you can specify any number of options. If you look through the documentation that is linked from this week's reading, you'll see when you look at the map, the open layers map object, the, the first sheet of the doc, at the top of the documentation for that, there's a whole list of properties that can be specified for creating a map object. These are examples of some of those, those options that you can uh, provide when you're creating that map object. We then go through a process of creating our set of Google map layers. And this is, again, that process, just like we were seeing earlier, where we're creating a variable name. In this case, is GPHY, GMAP, G hybrid GSAT as shorthand, but still somewhat meaningful short variable names that we can use to refer to these layers that we're creating. So just like I was describing earlier when we were creating, creating that open street map or OSM layer, it was an open layers dot layer dot OSM. Here we have dot Google because we're creating a Google layer. And if we've properly linked to the Google API up above, open, uh, open layers will be very happy um, in being able to the, then understand how to connect to and create this Google layer. Here we provide a name. So this is a name that can then be displayed in something like that layer picker that I was showing you a few minutes ago. So this is essentially a label for the map or for the, for the layer that is available to be shown in the interface. And then finally, we have this option where we're defining, in this case, one key value pair. So this, this is a potentially a longer list of essentially settings that are associated with, or options that are associated with this layer. In this case, there's one option that we're setting. We're defining the type to the Google Maps map type ID dot terrain. That's the value that Google asks you to provide them to say, I want the terrain map. So we go through and do this again for the um, street maps. You'll notice I'm not specifying the map type ID here because street map is the default. If you don't specify a map type, you're going to get a Google street map. But here, we are defining the number of zoom levels that we want to um, actually associate with that layer that is being added to our um, open layers. So this, this defines the limits within which the, that layer will be requested, okay? The zoom limits within the open layers client within which it's going to be requested. Um, we then add a hybrid map where we do, in this case, have to specify the type, and we're specifying the number of zoom levels again. And then the satellite, again, the label, the type, and then the number of zoom levels. Okay, so these are all options. Again, there are, there are other options available as well um, that, are that are provided in the documentation. Every layer type has its own options, and its own sort of pattern for defining what that layer is. Next week, so we'll see an example of some OGC WMS layers in the quote code I showed you today. We're actually going to talk about adding WMS layers next week. Um, these, these options are critical in defining those WMS layers because they're defining some of the key values that need to be defined to be able to interact productively with a remote WMS system. Um, so every layer, every layer type is going to have its own options that you need to be looking for. With these, we've only created the layers. We haven't actually added them to the map yet. This command here, map.addLayers, then actually adds those layers to the map. So they're then going to be displayed as a part of the map or made available to the map through the, through the layer picker. Yes? Um, so you, going back to the zoom levels, yes. you're specifying like 20 levels, but for Google Maps, isn't it only until 60? 
How does that work? Yeah, and these may actually be, uh, these, these numbers, I, now I have to look through my examples again. These numbers are actually um, not Google Map zoom levels, but open layer zoom levels. Um, because you will get errors if you request <coughs> map layers outside the range supported by Google. So you need to sort of throttle the request that Open Layers is going to use in sending those requests to Google. And these values work. <laughs> so, so Google doesn't complain when you request um, layers outside of that range. So any questions about the Google layers? OK. So the Bing layers, you'll notice we didn't import any sort of Bing API um, earlier. Um, that's because the Bing API has essentially been um, integrated into the open street layers uh, or open, open layers <laughs> JavaScript code. So open layers uses Google's code for interacting with Google. Open layers has actually assimilated the model for interacting with Microsoft's map services directly into the open layers. So we're not importing the Microsoft library <coughs> as a separate JavaScript code base here. We're actually just using what Open Layers has built into it for interacting with Microsoft. So that's a slight variation on how the Open Layers developers have essentially built their dependencies on, on other, other sets of code. So here, we have three Bing layers that we're adding. Following a similar model, um, that we did uh, earlier in terms of creating the layer objects and then at the end adding them to the map. And you can do this one at a time or you can do them as groups like I've done. Either way. Um, so the first one we're basically uh, requesting uh, the Bing roads map. We're providing our API key for each one of those requests and we're specifying the map type as road. So these are, this is the way you specify the options for a Bing layer. And you'll notice it's a little bit different than the Google uh, specification. It's just the way the developers have set up sort of the options and the way you specify them. Variable from layer type to layer type. So you have to provide the API key. Um, to be get to get a, a response from Google, from uh, from Microsoft, and here we're just creating these um, these three types or three layers. And you'll see the types that we're using are road, aerial with labels, or just aerial, corresponding to you know with what we're already familiar with in terms of Google, Google's um, road map. Essentially, sort of their hybrid, Google's hybrid, where you're getting labels in conjunction with the imagery or just the satellite imagery, okay? Once we've created those objects, I'm then in one command, adding those three layers to, to the map that we've created. So we're incrementally adding layers of different types to that map. And now we're adding our OpenStreetMaps layer. And this is an example of sort of that single layer add model where you'll notice here, I'm using map.addLayers. <laughs> where here, I'm using map.addLayer. The subtle difference here is that addLayers um, requires you to provide a list of layers enclosed in these square brackets here, okay? If you're adding a single layer, you just provide that layer object inside those, those uh, um, parentheses. So again, that's a subtle difference that sometimes is not obvious as you're starting to look through the code. So there are two options, add layers, provide it a list, add layer, provide it one layer object. So here, we're creating that OpenStreetMap uh, layer and adding it to the map. So this is uh, 
where we're actually then going through that set, set map center op, uh, process again that I fumbled my way through on the previous example. <laughs> going through that coordinate transformation process as I defined latitude longitude values at the beginning of this at the beginning of this block of JavaScript where I want to center the map, and then I'm converting those into the um, you know here it's the nine zero zero nine one three. Or, you know, I refer to that in the comment, but it's actually the, I always have to look it up, the, the other name. <laughs> the, the official EPSG code that corresponds to that Google projection. So it's just doing that, that, um, that conversion. The last thing that we're going to go, in, go through in more detail in just a second is we're adding a new control to our map. We're actually adding the control that is going to display all of these layers as a list of layers that you can choose from to choose which one is going to actually be displayed. Okay? And then if we look, so we've got, and then we've got the style. The style is not changed from before. And then we've got the basic structural elements down here as, we've, as, we've, as we're very familiar with in terms of you know, the div that the map is going to go into and whatever other HTML content you want to add. So any questions about this? Okay. So now we've got controls. <laughs> um, this is actually not too different. It's a simplified, um, we're, we're not using all of the base maps, but we actually have in this case added some WMS layers. So if I go to my layer picker, layer switcher here, you'll see now that I have two types of items in the list here. If we go back, let's see. We go to the layer picker here, you'll notice that all we have is a section called base layer, which you can actually change in your code if you want. Um, but we have this list under base layer where we have radio buttons for all of these layer types. In the web interface uh, vernacular, radio buttons mean you get to choose one and only one. When you choose one, it disables the, uh, any of the others. And that's how open layers handles base layers. When you define a layer as a base layer, it knows to essentially display it as a part of this list of base layers. You can only choose one at a time. If we look at now that I get my examples out of order here. Okay. So here you'll notice that we have a new category of layers that are provided here in the layer switcher. We've got our base layer that any of the base maps, you know, the Google base maps, the Bing base maps, the um, open street map, those are by definition uh, base layers unless you actually explicitly say otherwise. Um, but you can also then add overlays. And those overlays, you can specify them as base layers or as, as overlays. And if, if they're essentially non-base layers, you then get actually checkboxes so that you can enable more than one layer as a part of your map. And you can provide the user with the option to turn those individual layers off and on. It just so happens that these three layers are coming from um, web map services, which we'll talk a lot, about, uh, a lot more about next week. But what I wanted to show you now is if we view the page source for this. Yep. That map is, um, it should be linked from the lecture notes. Yeah, the last page of the lecture notes. There are a bunch of links sort of in series. So this should be the layer switcher uh, example. Um, In this case, since we're not using any of the other um, uh, base maps, we're just using the OpenStreetMap open 
I'm only needing to import the open layers JavaScript library. So this is more like that stripped down. First example I showed um, here in lines 8 through 12, we're setting those global variables again, um, just like we've done in the previous examples. Here in line 15, we start our initialization function. And we're creating our open layers uh, map object that we're then going to start adding things to. Um, you can see this example is a little bit older as I actually was, I used the uh, EPSG 900913 uh, code for the uh, projection. Um, that's now appropriately replaced with some other values. Um, here, for the uh, maximum extent, I just have actually the numerical values in meters for the bounding box that we want to want this this uh, this map to use by default as the initial view. Um, so that magical incantation of a calculation that I showed in the previous slide, these are the numbers that would come out of such a calculation. So you can just provide the numbers. You don't have to do the calculation like I did. Um, we're setting the maximum resolution in the units, just like we saw during the previous example. Um, we're adding our, we're creating and then adding our OpenStreetMap. And in this case, and we'll really dive into these options next week, we're then creating three additional layers and adding them to the map for, um, for the uh, counties, uh, Native American lands, and federal lands. So these are actually, in this case, pointing to services hosted by USGS for these base map layers or for these, these web map services. Um, it's a great way to be able to tap into somebody else's data uh, without having to publish it yourself or even create it yourself. And we'll talk more about WMS. But what we do have here is this explicit command again to add the layer switcher. Um, you will often get the layer switcher by default if you add multiple layers to your map, but this is an explicit way to do it. And that's it. You know, basically the rest of it's all the same as what we've looked, what we, all the others that we've looked at. But there are a bunch of other controls that are available besides the layer switcher. And you have access to all of them through the, uh, the way you, uh, can uh, control the map and, and the content of the map. So if we go to the same set of map definition, uh, layer definitions, so we've still got our open street map, we've still got our three WMS layers, you'll see down at the bottom of the page, and I tried to get this unified finally, where I'm showing at the bottom of each of these examples which specific controls are enabled. So you have a quick indication from looking at the, at the example which ones we're talking about. Um, in this case, we have um, basic navigation. So, uh, you know, the ability to actually interact with the map. We've got the pan zoom bar, which is different from the default. So if we look at our previous map, you've got this little, this dinky little plus and minus. Um, there's a different control called the pan zoom bar that gives you this little control here for zooming via the interface and then you can actually pan using the little arrows here. So this is an alternative way to provide interface elements that control or visually represent the panning and zooming capabilities. Um, we have the layer switcher. We've already seen that a couple of times. Um, a new control is the permalink, where this is a link that by default, this is a link that shows up by default down here in the lower right hand corner. It's this little teeny thing down here. Um, that actually is a link, if you look at the bottom of the browser, this totally illegible link that's showing up is actually the representation of the current state of the map what layers are turned on, where I'm zoomed, all of that, so that you could potentially, you know, if we zoomed in to Albuquerque, 
Dang it. And I turned on something that won't even show up here. Actually, we've got the U.S. counties, so that's good. Let's add the, add the U.S. federal lands as well. So now we've got these things. I can actually say copy, copy the link address. So you know, I could do the same thing. I could copy it and put it into an email to send to somebody or whatever. I could open up a new tab here, paste that address in, and you can see this is basically what that, that link looks like where it has some additional information that's been provided as a part of that. If I hit enter, it thinks about it. Think some more. Think some more. <laughs> the fact that I'm on this screwy wireless network. And <laughs> actually, it, it, in this case, yeah, it should have zoomed because it actually specifies the zoom level here, but it didn't actually replicate the zoom that I had set. So that may actually be a bug in their permalink. But the other, the other characteristics, it, re it centered it properly. So if I were to zoom in a bunch, it should at least, it didn't even center it properly. So much for a useful permalink. <laughs> so it's a permanent link to some of the information about your map. <laughs> Where did my example here go? OK, so this is what it should have looked like, but it didn't. Um, Mouse position, this gets to um, that display projection uh, property that, that um, we set up above. If it's different from, if you want to display different coordinates than, than the map coordinates, that display projection controls how the, like this mouse position is shown down in the lower left corner of the, of the map. So if you see me moving around, you'll see those numbers changing in the map down that lower, le lower left corner or lower right corner, yeah, lower right corner. Um, if I wanted to show this in uh, latitude, longitude, that's where I would potentially change that display projection option for the map, and it would do the calculations to display it in latitude, longitude instead. Um, and then it also shows uh, this measure control, which, oh, where did it go? Why am I not seeing it? Where is my measure control? I am lost. <laughs> I'm not sure it's even being displayed properly. But that should be on should be on the map, or I could have copied and pasted it in and I'm not actually enabling it. Let's look at another one. Well, let's, let's first look at the code to display this. So like the others, we're bringing in the open layers JavaScript. We're setting some variables. And this is where I'm actually creating this new variable that's just a list of controller objects. So yeah, and this explains why my measure wasn't showing up. I had it on my list down below. but. I don't actually have it in the set of controls I'm adding here. <laughs> um, the, uh, and so I'm just doing a series of these new open layers control, navigation, pan zoom, layer switcher, permalink, mouse position. I'm creating all of these new um, control objects that are a part of this list. And then I'm passing those down when I create the map you'll notice there's now this controls element here where you could just provide this list. You know, you could just type all of this stuff in with the, um, with the um, essentially the square brackets around them as a part of this control, what you put in after the controls here. But this is a way to sort of encapsulate that list separately so you can just refer to it by name instead of um, otherwise um, typing it into this, what would then be a grow, an increasingly large 
map creation block of code, that would be more prone to errors. The more you nest things, the more opportunities you have for things to go badly. <laughs> You could be, you could be. So this one is, of course, the name. See, is the name showing up here? The uh, this is this is called Open Layers Three Underbar Measure. Is the name of this particular uh, HTML file? Um, so I've got this list of controls, and then I'm feeding that list of controls as one of the options for the controls when I'm creating my map object. Again, there are a bunch of controls available to you and they're, they're all described in the documentation and in the reading. Um, but this is a, a, a useful model for being able to sort of define the controls you want to add and then um, adding them to your map. And then we've got you know, our standard layer creation stuff. Same, same old, same old. But in this case, we're defining a bunch of, bunch of additional controls that we want to add. So what if instead you want to provide a static map? You don't want the users to do anything but look at the beauty of your map composition and all the layers you've, you've created. You can do that by um, explicitly disabling all the, all the controls. So you'll notice here, I can click on the map. I can't drag it. There is no zoom or pan. There is no layer switcher. I get what I'm given, and that's it. It's a, it's a, we have now created a non-interactive, dynamically generated map. <laughs> um, to do that, what we do is we basically just use this controls option when we're creating our map object. The rest of the code is the same, so I'm not going to keep repeating myself over and over again. Here we're creating our map object. We're using this controls option, but you'll notice I'm p passing it basically an empty list of controls. So there are controls that are displayed by default. So if you don't specify controls, you're going to get that little, that little plus minus in the upper corner. If you have multiple layers, you're typically going to get the layer switcher. And that's about it. But if you don't even want that to show up, and you're going to get the navigation by default as well. So you sort of get three controllers without having to say anything, depending on how you've defined your map. But if you want to achieve this, what you need to do is basically explicitly say, I want no controls. And you do that by giving it this empty list of controls as the value for that controls option when you're creating your map. Does that make sense to everybody? So you're basically turning off any of the defaults and saying, no, I want to define them all myself, and I'm telling you to show none. Here, this is an illustration of yet another one of the controls that you may find useful is the overlay map. So, you know, as, as, as you are developing an application and you want to be able to provide some information about a, a global context or a larger context within which the current map view exists, you can use this overlay map. So, if you, if, let's see, because it's not going to scale the depiction much. But you'll see this red dotted box in the overlay map in the lower right corner. That corresponds to the current map area. So if I zoom in, you'll see that box changes size. So we have this constant view of sort of centered on the western hemisphere. And this, this would provide the user with some clue, especially as we zoomed into areas that maybe we weren't familiar with. And there are options to actually have the overlay map zoom in somewhat as well for showing a regional context within which your local context is. And that's part of, again, the options for that control. Uh, um, but that is, that is something that you can enable as an overview map. So, you know, if we look at the code for this. In this case, I've created the base controls 
as essentially a common set of controls that I want to add and I'm individually adding and I'm adding the, the base controls here as a part of the definition of the map, you can add a control after the fact. We saw that at the very beginning as I added that layer switcher. Here I'm adding the overview map after the fact. After I've created the map, after I've added all the other layers, I have this single line of code here on line 73 where I'm adding that overview map as well. As I was saying earlier, the overview map, like any of these other, um, these other uh, controls, have options. But they also have defaults. So in this case, what we are seeing in that overview map is based on the defaults that, that um, it pulls from the rest of the map context. But these parentheses that are after our overview map and that actually follow all of our other um, controls here allow you to specify, tune up the way those controls are going to be displayed. One way to do that is by changing the positions of the controls. This is where things sometimes get a little twitchy because some of the controls have options that you can define when you create the controls for defining where those controls should be displayed. In other instances, you end up having to use styles. It varies from control to control. It also varies a little bit in terms of how you want to do it because there are some limitations uh, in terms of defining it using the control options that you can sort of override or trump using actual cascading style sheet styles that can be linked to many of these objects as well. Here I'm going to show you how to move some controls using the options associated with those controls. So in this case, we've moved the scale and, let's see, the scale, no, actually, no, in this case, I'm just adding the scales. I haven't moved them yet. It's this last one that's showing them having been moved. All right. Now, wait a second. Where'd my moved one go? Did my order get messed up? <laughs> I have too many tabs open here. Let me just, let me just open up. Oh, I didn't open it. That would explain it. <laughs> okay, so here is an example with controls that have been moved. And I noted in the base here that in this case, we moved the pan zoom bar and we moved the scale line. I didn't describe the scale and, and scale display options, but I think by this point, you know, these are, these are the scale controls, what they look like. You can get an indicator of the scale of the map as, as OpenLayers tries to calculate it, and then a visual representation as well. Those are two separate controls. There's the uh, scale line, which is this one here, and then there's the scale, which is actually calculated numerically. But this is also now illustrating having moved some of these controls to a different location within the map. So let's look at the code for this. And of course, I changed browsers. Let me open this up. And let me, because at least I can make the text a little bit larger. So, in this case, we are, let's say I need to make sure I'm going to the right place. So, I've defined a named um, control ca called pan control, so that's up here. So I'm, I'm creating that as a separate object that I can refer to by name. Um, and in this case, I didn't specify the options here, though I could have. Instead, I'm using this option down here. So I have that pan control object that, ref that refers to that pan control in the interface. 
and I'm using this move to method for it to say I want to I want you to move it to this pixel location 650 700 so this is a way I can say you know I don't want it in that default upper left hand corner I want to show it someplace else as a part of the map and I'm doing the same thing with this scale line control that was created as a separate con separate control up above here my indentation got messed up so it looks like there's some like grouping going on here but these are essentially individual uh, named controls that are being that are being created and manipulated so I've got the scale line control here and then I'm using this move to method here to move that to a non-default location for that control so this is again something to look at in terms of the um, the options you have and the methods you can use for these controls for positioning them within the map environment Okay, so that has sucked up most of the time for tonight's class. <laughs> um, but hopefully this has provided enough of an illustration of some of the capabilities that you're playing with as a part of this week's milestone, and then we'll be feeding into next week's milestone as we start working with some WMS layers. Um, and hopefully also illustrating the um, commonalities in terms of the, and building on the JavaScript and Google Maps model that you, you got experience with earlier. The bottom line here is that, and I mentioned this in the lecture, is that open layers, it is more complex than working with Google Maps. Um, that complexity is largely uh, based on the many, many, many additional options you have in terms of um, different types of data you can uh, display in, in open layers, um, the ways you can interact with those data, uh, the capabilities it provides for actually creating data within the client interface. This is where I would encourage you to take a look through the, that gallery of examples that's uh, linked from the lecture because there, there are some pretty interesting um, uh, examples in there for doing things like you know, user interfaces where users can dry, draw polygons on, on the screen and then you can actually save those as geographic um, data. Um, open layers supports a much longer list, well, it's, you know, there is a list of supported formats uh, <laughs> that's beyond KML, which is pretty much, you know, one of the, the um, lone external formats supported by the Google Maps API. Uh, so if you're wanting to work with data that you've created in other formats or that are published by other folks, Open Layers is a good choice for supporting that, the, the, those more diverse uh, data sources and data providers. Um, there's good support for the Open Geospatial Consortium standards. So, for example, if you're wanting to integrate data services from USGS or NOAA or you know, ArgIS, um, you can actually tap into those data services and build your own map composition completely based on services that are provided by other people. And that's a very um, powerful uh, capability. Before you even get to what we will be talking about um, later in the course in terms of publishing your own data as OGC services, but then you can even publish your own data and integrate it with the data that are available from those other providers into a single map interface here. So it really depends on what your particular requirements are, whether you know Google Maps in terms of the data that are the, the base maps that are available are sufficient and the data that you want to display are supported by that. You know, Google Maps is is uh, is probably the quicker and dirtier solution, or I should say the quicker solution. It may be a completely adequate and appropriate solution for what you want to do. But as you are contemplating more complex mapping applications where you have more diverse data you're wanting to interact with or other services, whether you're wanting to uh, provide some tools for interactivity, the creation of data, or uh, more control or options, Open Layers is, is definitely um, another strong contender. Um, there are uh, now you know, other uh, JavaScript frameworks for doing interactive mapping as well. 
Uh, Leaflet is one that uh, is getting a lot of traction right now. Uh, open layers, this version of open layers has mediocre support for mobile devices like phones and tablets. Um, Leaflet is one that actually has really good support for those platforms. So that's another you know, thing to think about in terms of uh, you know, sort of the platforms you choose. Google Maps actually has good mobile support in terms of understanding touch interfaces and those sorts of things. So it gets, again, it get, you know, there's no, you know, this is the best solution that will meet all of your needs uh, answer, but there are pros and cons to these various technologies that you're likely to encounter. And that's one of the reasons why I wanted to show several of, at least a couple of them, so you could get a taste for the, what that, that thought process is for being able to think about, you know, what are my needs and how do they match with the capabilities of any of these systems? 